Continuing on in our season three Bible roundtables of the chosen, of course, we need to talk about John the Baptist in episode six, talking about how his disciples came and questioned Jesus, asking if he's truly the Messiah, all this different stuff. Did John doubt? And what is the outcome of this? I think this is a really important scene to John's character arc, understanding that, yes, he did ask these questions, and yes, it was a legitimate question, but how does that affect our beliefs about him? And how do we continue, you know, dealing with John the Baptist when he's asking these questions, he's doubting, but at the same time, Jesus is saying that he's the greatest out of all that are born from a woman. I don't know. It's kind of confusing, to be honest with you. But let's look at this biblical roundtable and think about John the Baptist and everything that's going on with him in season three, episode six. So we get to John the Baptist sending his disciples. And this is one of those passages that has vexed lots of people um, and made them wonder, well, because John the Baptist was such a faithful follower and was so loyal to Jesus and was preparing the way, calling him the Lamb of God, Uh, surely when he sends his disciples to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we look for someone else? He couldn't have meant it. It it must have been a metaphor, a teaching opportunity for his disciples. Um, I don't think that's an implausible uh, uh, take, except for the fact that after that question is asked, Jesus says about John, well, you you know, he he has questions and he's the greatest. You know, he uh, felt to me like he's illustrating that even the greatest is capable of, of of asking questions like this. Uh, what's your take? Uh, was was John being sincere? Was it that he was in prison for longer than he expected? Yeah. The Messiah was supposed to set prisoners free, and he's like, all right, you know. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, yeah. This is a really interesting thing. We're going to hear their, their comments in a second, but if we think about John the Baptist, right, and how he's, what situation he's in. He's in prison. He knows the Messiah is supposed to let prisoners free. He is cousins with the messiah like he's really wondering these things that are he was hoping would happen but aren't yet and so as we think about this there's a lot of different outcomes that people have come to over the years including but not limited to john actually sending his disciples so that they would no longer follow john but follow the true messiah again this is something that andrew even had to go through in his journey he had to go through this whole like John was my mentor, but now Jesus is my mentor. He's, he's my rabbi. He's my teacher. He's actually the Messiah, so I'm following him. And he kind of has to let John go. But a lot of people believe that John actually sent his other disciples to Jesus in order to do the same thing so that they would follow him instead. I don't, I don't know. There's a lot of different disputes about this passage in particular. Like Dallas said, it's vexed a lot of people. It's confused a lot of people over the years because they can't fully understand why John, who is the greatest of all the prophets, would have this doubt or this issue. So this is a good a good roundtable for sure. I'm, I'm loving what they're saying here. Real quick, if you want to join us on our next Israel trip, you can join us in January of 2024. This is going to be an awesome trip with Isaac David, who runs Daily Disciple, and John McRae, who runs What Do You Meme here on YouTube. They're amazing content creators, but they're also very smart biblically. So I'm excited for this trip, getting to learn from them, and just to meet you all. So if you want to come on that trip, all the details are in the link in the description down below. Anyway, let's get back to the video. Yeah, I I think timing is a big part of the story and the frustration of you know, what's going on. I mean, obviously, you know, his parents supernaturally conceived and his mom understood that uh, Mary was pregnant with the uh, chosen seed. And so, you know, there was this uh, whole expectation probably about who this child was and probably just waiting, when is the time for him uh, to be revealed? So I think there was probably some questions about timing what are you waiting for probably some kind of frustration kind of look i'm in jail and <laughs> i'm right. gonna wait <laughs> don't leave me hanging here <laughs> have you guys ever been there have you ever been at that point when you're like god you said you're gonna help me and you haven't yet you know I, I know i've been there in my life when i've just been in a season of waiting and having to go through all this different stuff have you ever been there where you're just struggling like John was and being like, I thought you were going to do something, but you're not, you know, I thought you were going to do it this way, but you're doing it this way instead. Um, I think we've all been there for sure. You yeah. know? Right. Um, well, and we, we hinted at this in, in season two, which uh, we were kind of setting up a little bit for season three. And some people were uncomfortable with it because they didn't, they didn't see it. 
John the Baptist and Jesus as people who would have had kind of an argument or a debate and I, something I asked, asked you about because I've always seen, and you, you affirmed this, that a lot of times J Jewish people, especially relatives, this is how they talk. Sometimes yeah. people think it's arguing, to them it's love. Yeah. You know, this is how we, we, we engage with each other, and so we wanted to show that. But we were, we were also illustrating in season two a little bit of John's impatience. He at times was like, why aren't you confronting the kings? Why aren't you going? And Jesus was talking about his time, and, and, his, and so we thought, there's something, there could be something to this, that even if John the Baptist believes that Jesus is the Messiah, of course, maybe he's he's a little bit more impatient. Well, in the Nazareth synagogue, he comes to set the captives free, and he's a captive, and, right. and you, you proclaimed yeah. it, and I'm not free, and <laughs> right. you proclaimed you, you the favorable day of the Lord. Well, where's the favor? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it doesn't, probably in his mind, what, he, what he's preaching, what he's saying, isn't adding up to what he's experiencing. Plus, he's, he's in a jail cell, and it's probably not a cell with bars. It's probably a hole in the ground that he's been lowered into that's probably airless and bad. Mm -hmm. There's an idea in Catholic spirituality called the dark night of the soul, and if it was written by mm -hmm. uh, John of the Cross, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a saint who was in prison when he wrote it. But the idea is that, th that there are times when God strips away everything that made us certain before. Mm -hmm. The feeling of God's presence, the, the surety and confidence, and the goal of that time is to have faith in God and to continue to seek faith in God even without those things. So I almost wondered if you were playing at sort of a dark night of the soul moment for John. And, and so this is him really not saying he lost faith, but trying to get back the faith that he had yeah. and it preached for so long. Yeah, Dark Knight of the Soul is actually also a term that is often used in writing, you know. the Yeah, I've heard it in terms of, like, writing stories and playwriting and, and things like that, um, script writing, where it's kind of this moment of, like, the hero is at his end. He's at his, he's at his worst, um, and then he needs to come out of that. The, the writer's journey, Joseph Campbell, uh, yeah. all of this, have, you know, it's, it's considered to be a, a good writing technique, a storytelling technique to take your hero to that dark night of the soul. Mm -hmm. And we do that throughout The Chosen, as oftentimes and we see with, with Simon here approaching the same thing in, in, in our later episodes oh, yeah. of the season where he's mm -hmm. like, he's had his dark night. Absolutely. Of the soul. Yeah. And so, yeah, we thought, we, I mean, it, it, didn't, it didn't make me question John the Baptist's loyalty to think that there would have been an opportunity in his life where he was like, okay, what is going on here, man? Like, mm -hmm. I thought this was, was going to go quicker. Yeah, uh, certainly the soon, the definition of that word soon, uh, what does that mean? And um, that certainly plays in here. Uh, I, I don't think that John the Baptist is being impatient. Um, I think this is a sincere question, but not a sincere question that's lacking in faith. Yeah. I really like this, this take uh, that he has here for sure. He believes that God's Messiah is going to uh, come to save the world. And if it's not Jesus, he wants to put his faith in the right person. He's mm -hmm. not giving up on the Messiah idea altogether. He's not throwing it all out. He's, well, it's not happening yet. Maybe it's not Jesus. Maybe it's somebody else. But I, I'm going to find out. Right. So I'm going to send messengers to ask Jesus, point blank. Um, I tell students that um, there's different kinds of doubt. There is the skeptical doubt that says, I don't care what the facts are, I'm just not going to believe. But that's not the kind of doubt John the Baptist has here. He has the kind of engage and learn kind of doubt. They, I'm asking this question because I want to find out the answer. Right. My faith in, is sincere. I want to be putting it in the right place. So he sends the messengers to ask Jesus this question. Are you the one to come, or should I be putting my faith in somebody else? Right. And I think Jesus' response is wonderful, because Jesus doesn't say yes or no. Mm -hmm. He gives a list of evidence right. that all comes right out of the book of Isaiah, which we've heard John the Baptist quote many times, that you guys have written that in, and said, you just go back and tell John these pieces of evidence. And... He'll put it together that I'm the right guy. And that's enough. And then he... Yeah, it reminds me of Jairus a lot, like we've talked about on this channel. Jairus being the leader of the law, like we've talked about. Um, 
this this was like a moment for for John to go back in Isaiah and look at all these other other things and for him to be like oh of course like there's all this evidence now now I have I have regained my confidence right and walking through that for sure turns to the crowd after the messengers are gone and rather than make fun of well that was a stupid question mm -hmm. he doesn't make fun he praises him he says wait He's not a sinful doubter. I mean, he ha he doesn't have an easy life. He's in prison. This is not what he's been expecting. Mm -hmm. He's not a reed shaking in the wind. And mm -hmm. Another metaphor about a person who's doubting. Um, no, he's he's the best of all the prophets. Uh, yeah, yeah but, I think yeah, it's a great. Yeah, and I think there's maybe a couple of things. I mean, one is John is coming in the spirit and the power of Elijah, mm -hmm. and he knows the prophecies from Elijah who's gonna come and prepare the way for the great and terrible day of the Lord, right? And what the, and, and based upon reading those prophecies, he's like, look, I'm coming in the spirit and the power of Elijah. We've seen the spirit come upon you, right? It's kind of like, you know, let's see that, we've seen partial fulfillment, let's see the, where's the rest of the fulfillment. But I also think there's also something, it's not in the text, but could also be plausible, which is John had disciples. Mm -hmm. And it might be mm -hmm. as much or more so for the sake of those disciples who are like, they believed based on his testimony, this is the Lamb of God. Mm -hmm. But now they're looking at their teacher in prison and they're not as mature as John. They don't have the history or the knowledge, even familial, with going back to his parents. They, it might also be for their sake, yeah. possibly mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, very good. Yeah, and I think some people believe that's, exa that's solely what it was. Yeah. It was just for their sake. But I think if that was the case, Jesus wouldn't have said, no. go tell John yeah. that X, Y, Z. And I, 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 I believe it was a sincere question on John's part yeah. that Jesus was giving a sincere answer. Yeah. Is that is that uh, supported by, by a Catholic oh, teaching as well? Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Well, because I've found in, uh, I would say, more in Jewish and Catholic tradition than even evangelical tradition, the, the embracing of questions mm -hmm. and, and even doubts, like express them, <clears throat> wrestle with them. Mm -hmm. Evangelicals tend to be a little less comfortable with yeah, them. Yeah, right. Which is super interesting to me. Like like here on this channel, like we dive deep into the questions, right? Um, because for me, that is what's integral to my faith and how I came how I came to be the Christian that I am today is by answering those hard questions that a lot of evangelicals do um, kind of avoid. And so I think for a long time in church history, when it comes to Protestantism, is like a lot of people have avoided those harder questions. Um, and I'm not 100% sure why that is. Like we have very good answers. Like there's not like these kind of like skate by, like I have to make up my answer. Like because we know the truth, there are very good answers for all these questions and, and so, I don't know, I wonder why that is in evangelical Christianity, because I do see that quite often in in terms of certain churches that I've seen growing up or, or been a part of or whatever. Um, but in, in my life, I've had a lot of mentors that have helped me to answer a lot of these really hard questions. Um, and so I think it's very fruitful and, 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 and good that we, that we think about those kind of things. But, yeah, anyway. Um, you know, God's Word, inerrant. You believe that's what faith is, and uh, it's, you know good churches encourage questions and stuff. But but it's it seems to be a much more comfortable thing, in, uh, particularly in, in the Jewish faith, where questions are like the, what you wake up in the morning. Well, it's a very <laughs> Jewish thing to answer a question with a question. Yeah, and we see Yeshua doing that many times throughout the Gospels. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yeah, yeah. right. Well, also to be able to hold things in tension, things that don't fit. You are the Messiah, but this isn't happening yet. Yes. Mm -hmm. And just waiting till. It, through grace and through mystery and time, all things are made re, made clear. Yeah. That's why I really love this story and the way Luke tells it in Luke chapter 7, and Matthew also tells it in Matthew chapter 11, um, and I try to encourage my students, many of whom are evangelicals, mm -hmm. that asking questions is a good thing. Don't pretend that you don't have questions when you really do. That's not sincere faith. Sincere faith is, I want to get questions answered. And I'm going to go to Scripture to find those answers. That Jesus yeah. points John the Baptist to Scripture um, to find the answer to his question, and uh, and then praises John the Baptist 
uh, for being able to do that. So in many ways, I think this is uh, one of the great benefits uh, of this television program that Chosen is getting people to face their own questions and then tell them, well, go read the book. It's right. always Yeah, I mean, this is a huge thing for me just in season one and season two coming face to face with these certain things like did that happen in scripture that way how is this how is this being played out in the chosen allows me to go to scripture and really deep dive to understand for myself maybe for the first time and so i think that is one of the the very best things that the show has done absolutely yeah always better than the movie anyway right. so yeah <laughs> yeah well, even in jewish tradition i mean even in the first century when a rabbi chose who would be his disciples and they were going to be the ones who represented him in the future it wasn't even just their level of knowledge, it was the level of questions mm. they would ask mm. of mm. him as he was testing them to see if they were worthy to become his disciples. Because he didn't want just people who would just spit out exactly what he said. He wanted people to be able to think critically. Yeah. And that's yeah. you know Good. part key part of being a leader. Mm. Something else that was kind of interesting, I don't know if it's up for discussion much, but uh, Jesus, quotes Aesop in, uh, in this uh, speech and that he's getting. This is an interesting thing too. If you don't know who Aesop is, you've probably heard the phrase Aesop's fables. He was kind of like a, a, a famous like poet slash fable writer. Um, and so you see Jesus actually quoting some of Aesop's work in scripture. And so this is a really interesting thing um, that happens here. And we see it in episode six of season three as well. Giving and, and the Bible doesn't mention the word Aesop, but I, I, there were a few viewers who were like, oh, wait a minute, why is he mentioned Aesop? That wouldn't have happened. But uh, that story of the children where he, where he talks about, uh, did we, uh, you, you danced, but, or uh, I'm blow, blowing it right now, but he talks about, we played the feud, flute for you, but you did not dance and, and whatnot. Uh, it, again, it wasn't uncommon for, for, uh, for Jesus or Jewish rabbis at that time to, to use folklore and to, to quote others, right? I mean, that wouldn't have been, and that's where that came from. Yeah, Rabbi Jason, I think, is going to talk about it here. But even Paul, like hearing how Paul uses the culture and he, he understands the culture enough to use it to point back to God. It's one of the things that I'm, I'm pretty diligent about when it comes to YouTube is because I want to know the culture well enough to where I can point to it to explain things about God um, in order to entice people to watch more of my videos. That's why we use The Chosen. It's why we use these different things to kind of hook people into our videos um, so that we can talk about Scripture, so that we can talk about the kingdom of God in a way that people are going to be entertained or at least learn from. And so, yeah, I totally love how Jesus is doing this here. Not only do we see Jesus doing examples of this, but also other disciples and, and especially Paul as he goes into these Greek philosophy areas and, and begins to talk about the culture in a way that you can see he truly understands, uh, even when he talks about, let's say, like the unknown God, right, and, and compares that to Yahweh and how that fulfills, you know, um, what they're thinking about in, in terms of the unknown God and, and Paul telling them that he is known, that he is like here, you know, um, so really, really cool. From, yeah. when, I, when I did the research, I'm like, oh my gosh, that came from Aesop. That's pretty cool. <laughs> you, you see Paul doing it. I yeah. mean, he's yeah. quoting uh, Greek philosophers mm -hmm. and he's uh, quoting all sorts of different uh, mm -hmm. pagan poets. Mm -hmm. And yeah. no, so I mean, I think, you know, theologically, all, you know, there's a sense in which all truth is God's truth, but there's also a sense in which, just like today, you live in a culture, there's certain things that are just common right. and yeah. familiar to right. who you are. And, right. He wasn't, he was part of the culture, part of the times, and he engaged it, which is, I think, important. But there's also a strand that, um, it's in a way, it's amazing it was left in, or it stayed in the canon, because there was, there was a suspicion of Greek philosophy and all that in the early church mm -hmm. that lasted till the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. you know, till Thomas Aquinas and others start to appropriate the wisdom that's in the Greek philosophers. So, mm -hmm. And I think it would have been suspect as a, in some ways, although they may have used it to keep it in an official document, you don't. We don't see a lot of it. Yeah, know. yeah. But it was some in Paul. Yeah, but, yeah. but when I when I read when I did the research on it and, and was just studying that whole passage, I thought, oh, that's, yeah, they, they talked about how it came from Aesop, and I thought that was interesting. And like you said, interesting that they kept it in, yeah, uh, in, in spite of the suspicion that there might have been about it. Uh, that's actually one of the things that some scholars say, well, that's a sign that it's really authentic. It really happened because it, it, otherwise it's a point of embarrassment. 
Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know, well, we should have scrubbed that out. Well, it must have really happened if you left it in. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. This is one of the one of the best kind of arguments that we see for scripture in general, and that's kind of the end of that that section there um, when he's talking about these different things. But I love that last section where we hear um, Jesus talking about Aesop's fables and how that is a a pointer towards this being authentic. It's it's the same exact thing as seeing the women discover Jesus's body is gone from the tomb. If you were making up the story, you would never have the women discover his body. Women's testimony is not trustworthy. It cannot be it cannot be taken seriously. So if that were the case and you're making up the story, the best version of the story would be to have Peter and James and John go find the body. And they're the ones that discover that Jesus was, was raised from the dead. But in the story how it is, it makes no sense in culture that it would be that way. There's a reason why God did it that way. Because he wants to show people, no, this is not a made-up story. This is something that actually happened. I hope you like this small part of our live stream. If you want to check out the full live stream, go over to our Patreon at patreon.com slash thesniplife. The best way to help us in this ministry and on our YouTube channel. Thanks.